why did the disciples go from frightened, timid followers of Jesus before his death to bald evangelists willing to die, preaching his resurrection if they just really made the whole thing up, right? And he was still dead. And it also says, why were the disciples willing to be tortured and killed for a known lie? It also says, why would they make up the resurrection story if Jesus turned out to be a fraud? And it says, what was their motive? And it says, how did the disciples, 12 ordinary people, pull off such a hoax? And then it says, why would thousands of people immediately convert if Jesus didn't actually rise from the dead? Why did the disciples make themselves look bad in the Gospels? And then it says, how did Saul of, Ta of Tarsus, the chief persecutor of Christians, convert to become the Apostle Paul, the chief, fo the chief follower of Jesus, if he didn't really have an encounter with a, with a risen Jesus? How could the disciples even steal the body in the first How could the disciples even steal the body in the first place? And I also read in in Matthew reading here was Matthew twenty twenty seven. Twenty seven sixty two. Matthew 27? 27, 62. Matthew 27, 62? Yeah. The next day, the one after preparation day, the, sh the chief priests and the Pharisees went to Pilate, sir. They said, we remember that while he was still alive, that deceiver said, after three days I will rise again. So give the order for the tomb to be made secure until the third day. Otherwise, the disciples may come and steal the body and tell the people that he has been raised from the dead. This last deception will be worse than the first. Take a guard, Pilate answered. Go make the tomb as secure as you know how. So they went and made the tomb secure by putting a seal on the stone and toasting the guard. After the Sabbath at dawn on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to look at the tomb. There was a, a violent earthquake, for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven, and going on, the Lord came down earth. The Lord came down from heaven, and going to the tomb, rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning, and his clothes were white as snow. The guards were so afraid, were so afraid of him, that they shook and became like dead men. The angel said to the woman, Do not be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Jesus, who was crucified. He is not here. He has risen, just as he said. Come and see the place where he, has, where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples, He has risen from the dead and is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him. Now I have told you. So the woman hurried away from the tomb, afraid yet filled with joy, and ran to tell his disciples, Suddenly Jesus met them. Greetings, he said. They came to him, clasped his feet, and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee. There they will see me. You don't have, you can read or you can explain it. Oh, yeah, but basically there, what I got out of that is just the guards, you know, it was this... It was a secure place. It's not like, oh, they just threw him there, everybody walked away, and whatever, and then he just, oh, the body's not there no more. There was guards, and they were guarding that place to make sure it was secure. They sealed the rock, make, made sure it was in place, and he said, do it like you know how to do it. So right there, it says, make the tomb as secure as you know how. So, obviously, it's not like it's something new, and they never done nothing like this before, so, you know, they made sure it was secure, and then it just wasn't there. Now you tell me there was guards and everything, so yeah, and that just does. If, if you study the rest, of, yes. I just want to add on to what Chris had just said because one of the things that separates God's resurrection from like Lazarus and Jairus' daughter being resurrected was that there was no other human agent 
included in that resurrection. He rose with the help of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit and himself. There was no human person who removed the rock. And whereas, like, where the, when they died, Jesus performed the miracle and rose him from the dead. But he himself ultimately rose. And it's, it's like you said, like, that's what separates him and makes him... That the ultimate the deity of Christ. Is a deity it, of Christ. It, it proves the deity of Christ. Exactly. Because we can go even deeper than that. Because you know we can't. People can try to compare his resurrection to the resurrection of Lazarus, but not understanding that Lazarus was resurrected, but he Bye, died again. Jesus. But he died again. And he died again. And right. he died again. Right. So Jesus resurrected for all eternity. For all eternity. So he is the. When the Bible says that he is the firstborn of God. And he is the first born of creation. It is not talking about that Jesus was created by God. Jesus was not created by God. The Bible says that in the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God. And the Word was God. When it's talking about in the beginning, it's not talking about the beginning of creation. It's talking about in the beginning of time. So, so he is, that's what the Bible says, he is the Alpha and the Omega. The, the transliteration of Alpha and Omega means that he never stops beginning and he never stops ending. So, so when we are, when the, when the day comes and there's going to be the new heavens and new earth and we're going to be transformed from this earthly body into the, into the new body that we're going to have. A, a question that I heard before was, you know, if everything in heaven or everything in the new earth and the, and the new heavens is going to be so perfect, wouldn't it, wouldn't it be perfectly boring? And not really, because we are going to live in eternity with God. Meaning that it's going to take an eternity to get to know Him. Mm -hmm. Because once you think that you know Him, He begins again. He never stops ending. And He never stops beginning. And it's going to take a whole eternity to get to know the Creator. Because our, our finite mind cannot... Gotcha. Grasp and capture the infinite God. Because his mind is infinite. Our mind is finite. And we can only understand who he is by what he has already revealed in scripture. Can I can I read um first Corinthians fifteen? Six? Fifteen six? No, like from the beginning of 15. Yeah, I know. Because it, I, I have it open right there. Can I that, can I yeah, read but, Okay? Where is it? Everybody go to First Corinthians. I'm like not excited six. about this. This is historical. <laughs> yes. When everybody gets there, please say amen. <laughs> so, yeah. Yes, we about to get down. All right, that's what I like to hear. Yeah, I was one time watching, well, this was like two and a half years ago, but they had the resurrection of Jesus Christ on the History Channel. History. Where they talk about the First Corinthians, chapter 15. I'm going to start from first one. Like, where I mean, have his body. Like, 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 oh. Oh. <laughs> if you don't have it, I mean, uh -huh, yeah. <laughs> yes. it, it is. It's historical. We, we just we have to understand before she starts reading. What we have to understand, you as a Christian, your faith that you have in God is not a leap in darkness. It's not the faith that you have and the faith that I have. It is founded and eradicated or evidence. Oh, he's of his resurrection of who he is. The creator has left hints of who he is Ooh. on the earth so that archaeology and science can find his footprints. Not his literal footprints, but the backtracking of the biblical times can be founded and it has been found such a case that the faith that we have, that we are not the kind of people that we can say, yeah, I have faith in God, but, you know, it's having faith, and, and that's it, and, and I have faith in God. Well, that's not enough, because we have been called, and we have been chosen to give a reason to those who ask for the hope that we have. You know, just like I got posted on, on, on Facebook yesterday. You know, what I believe in my heart must make sense in my mind. Because God has called you, which is the first and utmost commandment, is love thy God with all your heart and all your mind. Mm -hmm. yeah. We're not dumb people who sit in the pews and just say hallelujah. We are the kind of generation who know God because we studied him out. But before I put my faith in something, I need to make sure that it's true. 
No, we're not Jehovah Witness that we keep changing our doctrine every few months. You know, we're not the Mormons who keep changing our doctrine and our books every few months. Our faith has been found in the historical Christian faith since the beginning of the, when the church was first born. We still hold on and grasp on to, to the gospel of Jesus Christ. And you know, well, I don't want to get into that because then we're just, okay, I'm just going to read. <laughs> I was about to catapult elsewhere. Um, but yeah, 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 15 says, Moreover, brethren, I declare to you the gospel which I preached to you, which also you received and in which you stand, by which you are also saved. If you hold fast that word which I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you first of all that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again that third day according to the scriptures, and that he was seen by Cephas, then by the twelve. After that, he was seen by over 500 brethren. By how many? 500 brethren. His resurrection was no secret. He appeared before 500 people to say, you who that you crucified is alive. It's historical. Yep. Go ahead. Of whom the greater part remain to be present, but some have fallen asleep. After that, he was seen by James, mm -hmm. then by all the apostles. Then, last of all, he was seen by me also as, as by one born out of due time. For I am the least of the apostles who am not worthy to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace toward me was not in vain, but I labored more abundantly than they all. Yet not I, but the grace of God which was with me. Therefore, whether it was I or they, so we preached, and so you believed. Now, if Christ is preached that he has been risen from the dead... How do some among you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, then our preaching is empty and our faith is also empty. Yes, we are found false witnesses of God because we have testified of God that he has raised up Christ, whom he did not raise up, if in fact the dead do not rise. For if the dead do not rise, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. Then also those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men the most pitiable. 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 People can take pity upon us. <laughs> What version are you reading? Uh, yeah. Awesome, awesome scripture. It's awesome, awesome scripture. All these theories, like the swoon theory and, and Greeley theory, that oppose and try to reject the resurrection of Jesus Christ makes no sense. See, he was reading some of them. The swoon theory is the belief in the theory that Jesus Christ fell asleep on the cross. That he was given a potion to fall asleep on the cross. He was put in the tomb that he got up and left when he woke up. Okay, but we gotta we gotta we gotta make we gotta make sense of this. We gotta make sense of this because the people who brought up the swoon theory do not reject that he was beaten, he was fed upon, he was punched in the face, he was bitten by whips with, with nails, with six inch nails on the tip of the whips, and that when they whoop him, it will pull the flesh out. Okay? The nails, six inch nails, was put through his um uh uh wrist or or hand, was put in his foot. So you're gonna try to tell me that when Jesus got up, he had even enough strength to get up and push a tomb. Push a stone and walk out. A stone that was sealed. A seal. And push that when Mel has been put his, his foot in his hand. And he was whooping so bad that he fell in his own blood. So he actually swam in his own blood. So you're going to try to tell me that somebody who was beaten is in the me medically speaking, that is impossible for anybody to do. To get up and push and just walk out 
<laughs> after you just got beat up and stabbed. And, and also, in their own theory, if that well, not we all know that he wasn't like you know coach. they didn't give him like no punch or anything. But if he let's say that did happen, in their own theory, if he did get up and if, like how if he was like he was probably still drugs, you know, like it wouldn't make sense. You know, like that he would get up and push a stone or push the stone, like and just walk up, just like that. Get up with all these Adidas and stuff. It just doesn't. Make I have sense. it up on Wikipedia here. The swoon, the swoon theory. This is that even like it's even criti- it's even criticized by medical experts. It is criticized by medical experts. It's impossible. It's, it's not. It is impossible for anybody. What is this? And this guy, he was, I don't remember the name of him, but down. And he was saying that supposedly while he was in the cross, he fell into a coma. And that after they put him into the, into the, that they put him the thing, that he just woke up and he just walked out. Just to make no sense. Like, just always, <laughs> like another theory is that, that the disciples stole the body of Jesus and hid it. Yeah. Now, how does that make sense? Tr- Chris ma- made a good point in the beginning of class when he was reading. It doesn't make any sense. For example, if me, if all of us here were all his disciples, and we plan, we say, you know what, so it can make like look like, you know, that his words were true, let's uh go steal his body and let's go hide it, and then we're going to give our lives for the gospel. Nobody does that. Will you give your life and let yourself die for a lie? No! It doesn't make any sense. It does not make any sense, because if if anybody can prove to me that the resurrection never happened, I will get up out of this church right now. (coughs) I'm not wasting my time. But the reason why I'm here, and I give my life and my heart and my mind to it, because there is evidence yes. that it happened. I don't say I have faith because you know I feel it feels good. Or or I don't give I don't give my life to Christ because I was crying. They sang my favorite song when I gave my I don't say that. That's 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 fine, that's feigned faith. The faith that we have is unfeigned, meaning it is not counterfeit. It's not counterfeit faith because my faith is built on the evidence. Of the existence of God. That's why, you know, that's why we have to make sense of the situation. That's why when the Bible says that I'm getting into it now, after so many years in church, I'm getting into the scripture when it says, Look thy God with all your mind, with all your heart, and with all your strength. Christians just don't go to church. Christians give their mind, their heart, and their strength, and give it to God. That what I believe in must be real and true and make sense. That whatever the apostles and the the disciples preached about the resurrection, they were willing to give up their life, go into prison, be beaten up, be stoned. Because truth matters. Truth matters. That's why it's part of our motto. Because truth matters. In essentials, unity. In non-essentials, liberty. In all things, charity. Because the essentials of the Christian faith are the very fabric and thread of my faith. That we don't have to have another, we don't have to have music in our service. We don't have to have uh, we don't have to have another pew. We don't have to have another big building. Because if we don't ever have to, you take that away from me, my faith is still intact. Take the keyboard away from us. My faith is still intact. Take the microphone away from us. The, my faith is still intact because my faith has nothing to do with my surroundings. My faith has been eradicated on the foundation of Jesus Christ. Mm. That's what we must be careful of what we allow in our minds. We must be careful what we put in our thoughts because your thoughts use your mind. Your thoughts use your mind because whatever you put in your mind, that's what you think. 
And if you put trash in your mind, your thought patterns are going to be out of whack. Right? So it's very important that, that, that spirituality is good. Spirituality is great because we are spiritual people. You know, emotion is good because we are emotional people. But we do not judge nor interpret the things of God with your emotions. Because that's what have, this is what have, we have been taught for so many years. If it feels good, then it's good. You know, and the message sounded so good that the goosebumps came up and, and, and my hair stood up and I just felt like crying and I just couldn't put that in tears so it must be God. No! God has given you a mind. So whatever is being preached, I don't care if it's from me, I don't care if it's from the pastor, every teaching that we teach must be judged by your mind. It must make sense. It must be biblical based. It must be historically based. Because you're not going to put your faith on something that is a lie. No. Not. Because then it's not faith in God. It's faith on your own faith. And that's what a lot of the prosperity teachers are preaching nowadays. It's having faith in your own faith. And faith is a force. And faith is a force put into words. So whatever you say, you have creative power because whatever you say shall come to pass because you have faith in faith. So you're no longer having faith in God. It's whatever I say is going to come to pass. And that is anti-biblical. The Bible says, have faith in God. And if you speak to the mountain, it shall move. Why? Not because you have faith in your own faith that the mountain will move, but you have put your faith in God that God can move the mountain. Not you. And that's why I'm so passionate about talking about the Bible, talking about the essentials of the Christian faith, and talking about because we have to lay a foundation and get back to basics. That's why I named our class, you know, Driven Youth Ministries Tuesday night, Back to the Bible. This, this get away from the American culture and get away from the American way of having church. And let's get back to basics because the church has forgotten what they believe in, why they believe in what they believe in, and how to defend what they believe in. Like I was dealing with somebody today with Facebook. I, I put up a question on Facebook and says, you know, what are your thoughts about the, the eternal security of the believer? And somebody says, well, you're, you know, you're a Christian because you go to church. I would say, that, that's the American culture right there. That's the American culture right there. And I got to put it out because what America got church, what America teaches is if you go to church, you're a Christian. Mm -hmm. No, you go to church on Sunday, you're a Christian. So then I put my faith in my own faith so I can deal with the battles in my mind to say, well, you know, then I'm saved because I go to church every Sunday. <coughs> that's False witness. That is a false, watered-down, fake, counterfeited gospel. That's not what the gospel is all about. The gospel is having faith in God. And when you have faith in God, and when the Bible says believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, it's not saying, yeah, I know Jesus Christ is this. That's not believing. When you believe in something, you put your whole life on it. You don't say, well, yeah, I believe in that. We were talking about last week. We were talking about last Tuesday. You know, when somebody says, well, I have cancer, and, and, and I have cancer. So, so the doctor gives you the pill for you to heal, and you take the pill, and you drink it, and you're healed. And I have cancer. So I can say, well, I believe that the pill can heal because it healed Chris. But if I don't take it and swallow it, I'm not going to be healed. I can believe all I want to believe. I can believe as much as I want to believe in that pill. To heal. But if I don't take the pill, I won't be healed. Same thing with salvation. You can say, well, I know God exists. Knowing is that enough. It's taking action and giving your life 100% and making Jesus Christ your Lord and Savior of your life. Meaning that you trust it and you give him your life saying, I no longer want to live my will, but teach me how to love you. Teach me how to follow you. 
teach me your ways. And you get into the word and you get the word into you. And day by day, you are being renewed into the image of God. Day by day, you are being transformed. Day by day, we're not perfect, but we're being perfected. That's the Christian faith. That I don't rely on my work. That I don't earn salvation. As a matter of fact, I don't deserve salvation. I have it because it was a free gift given to me. Because as soon as we say, you have to earn salvation and went from Christianity to a cult. From Christianity to a cult. Jenny. Now that you said cult, um, one of the things that I encountered in like me studying over some stuff was that, that was that was the importance of knowing the essentials of like the historic faith, um, the essentials of the historic Christianity and stuff. Is because it's very easy for you to be manipulated by systematic religion, yes. and that if you if you don't know the essentials and if you don't know what the scripture says, you will easily be deceived by Christian cults and what seems to be like genuine Christian churches and the Church of God, and they're not. So th that's why it's important, and that's why I got really excited. Like I have so many notes; it's not funny. Like, because it's true, like, if you don't, if you encounter someone, especially in our society, like you said, a lot of people get caught up on the fact that our country was founded on Christian principles. It's funny that we don't abide by them, but it's like you said, there's people that say, oh, we're Christian because our country is, we believe every, what is it that, the what is the core, um, God we trust or something yeah. like that? That doesn't make you a Christian, and in order for you to know the difference and be able to explain it to somebody else and say, no, this is why what I believe in is different, is if you know the essentials, the ins and outs of the scripture, and what separates you from just a cult. <laughs> really. Vanessa, can you, you're, you're, and you're, you, this is, I'm so excited, and I just want to go there and hug you, because <laughs> I want, I, for real, I'm so excited, because... It feels like sometimes, and I want to be honest, and I know it's not this way. I know for a fact it's not this way. But sometimes I feel like I'm a loner. That what I say is like weird to people. When actuality, I'm talking about the basics. You know, because I don't prophesy cars and mansions and money. <laughs> then I'm weird. But in reality speaking, this is what we put our faith on. And this is what we committed to. <coughs> we committed ourselves to Exactly this. And if you don't know, we're going to read Ephesians. Vanessa, can you look at Ephesians chapter 4? Yeah. 